Shalom, shalom. We are here in the month of Adar. We are very fortunate this year that we have two Adars. We have two months of Adar because um, Purim will be in the second Adar. And some years have one month of Adar, some have two. So we get to be extra joyous twice, twice this year. Um, and so we will, for our Nigun, we're actually going to cheat and use some words. We like to sing without words, but we're going to use some words because there is a famous song for welcoming the month of Adar. And I'll put it in the chat here for you. Oi, me shammy, 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 from the start, there's two reads of this. One read of it is from the start of Adar, which is today. Joy should be increased. We should actually increase our joy each day. The other read of it is not that we should, but it will. It will. So... Um, Today's a good day to get COVID. I mean, there's no good time to get COVID. But today's a good day because that means every day would get better. Every day would get better from that point on, and it would be a steady. So it also means that things can't get worse. Um, so things are going to be good. It's going to be a good month for you and for all of us. And we hope to, um, if you are a local friend, um, if you are a local friend, we hope to do an in-person VBM Purim. So we've never done this before, but we hope to engage Purim together in person. Um, so stay tuned for that. But that is Misha Nichnas Adar. Happy, happy, happy Adar. It's a great, it's a great time. Okay, let's start with a poll. Our, our debate today is trust versus questioning. Let's start with a little poll question here. Are you more inclined to trust? Number one, to trust all people and trust God. You're a big truster. Number two, to cautiously trust. Number three, to be generally trusting, but loosely skeptical. Or lastly, to distrust everyone and distrust God. So what is your orientation? Are you a big truster of people and God? Are you a big distruster? Or are you, are you find yourself somewhere in the middle here? Okay, let's take a moment to see where folks fall out here. Okay, let's see our results. Let's see who's in the room. Levels of trust. You're all, oh, very interesting. Zero percent here are big trusters. Not even, uh, we don't trust all people, don't trust God. Okay, well, I mean, we're Jews. I mean, how can we be so trusting, right? And, uh, and I, none of us are totally distrusting. I mean, we're Jews. How can we be so distrusting? Right? So uh, we don't distrust everyone and we don't trust everyone. 54% cautiously trust, very interesting. And 46% to be generally trusting, but loosely skeptical. So today's debate, number 37, is about in our tradition. We know we should be questioning, we know we should be trusting. What is the balance? So trust is not a simple matter. We have all been betrayed. Who here hasn't been betrayed? by friends, colleagues, strangers, and maybe even worse. We've all learned to be cautious. As mentioned, Bill Gates in his end of the year blog post shared his optimism, but also his concerns for 2022. On the top of Bill Gates's list for concerns was the growing inability for Americans to trust the government. He wrote, if your people don't trust you, they're not gonna support major new initiatives. And when a major crisis emerges, they're less likely to follow guidance necessary to weather the storm. So let's say there's a pandemic and the government's like, we've got the best medical experts and here's what everyone should do. But 
about half the society doesn't trust the government, even the medical experts that are associated with the government. How do you manage crises? Let's, um, uh, unfortunately, friends, there's many other crises to come, similar to public health crises, that will require significant, coll significant collective collaboration and cooperation. If we do not trust, fundamentally, the people who are there, um, how will we manage that? So indeed, a 2019 poll of American adults showed that according to 75% of respondents, basic trust in the federal government was shrinking from this Pew study. I know Jews love the pews. <laughs> of course, we should not trust anyone or anything blindly. On the other hand, we should be concerned when the most basic levels of trust in a society break down. When huge segments of citizens don't trust medical experts, for example, because medicine has been politicized. In Jewish thought, we have a, a tension between trust and investigation. On the one hand, we learn of the value of bitachon, of trust, bitachon. And on the other hand, we learn of the value of machlokit or argumentation. A central problem involved in not living with trust is that anxiety will take over. With no one and nothing to trust, we can become so full of worry, paralyzing worry all the time. And that overflow of anxiety will not serve us or those around us very well. Lithuanian scholar and philosopher, Rabbi Eliyahu Dessler, writes in his great work, Mi Miktav Me Eliyahu, the true source of constant worry is that we have no bitachon, no trust, of attaining the external things that we desire. This desire for possession and taking, its realization always depends on others and external circumstances. Bitachon flourishes when we desire internal things, the desire to be, because in that we are not dependent on others. Therefore, one who desires material possessions feels deep within one's heart that the desire is futile and is not up to him or her. This is the root of worry. We learn from Tehillim, from the book of Psalms, again and again that we should trust in God. It says, trust in God at all times. O nation, pour out your hearts before God. The Lord is a refuge for us, Selah. For the psalmist, trust is the recipe for living without anxiety. This trust should not be mistaken, of course, for being passive. Psalms teaches also trust in God and do good, right? There's bitachon, but also asetob. You don't trust and then just sit back in your rocking chair, but you trust and then you go do. Yes, we have trust, but then we must go out and act. Hishtadlut or striving must follow bitachon and trusting. So what do we do? So what do we have trust in? Some of us may trust God. Some of us may trust science. Some of us may trust a very close friend, or we may trust our gut. We should investigate to see where we are ultimately placing our trust. When push comes to shove, who or what do I really trust? Steve Jobs, after being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, shared his ideology that guided his life, which he called connecting the dots. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect the dots looking backward. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future also. You have to trust in something, your gut, your destiny, your life, karma, whatever you call it, this approach has never let me down. That essentially seeing that the dots were connected in your past is a way of trusting that the dots will connect in the future. Trust is not only helpful on a personal level, but necessary on a collective level. Here's how Sachs explains it in his last book before he passed, Morality. Without morals, markets cannot function. Think about that. Without morals, markets can't function. The very words we use imply as much. The word credit comes from the Latin cred, the same root we seek in credo, meaning I believe. Confidence, the presence or lack of which shapes markets, comes from the Latin root fides, or meaning to have faith in something or something. Fiduciary has the same origin. Trust, the lack of which produced the banking crisis of 2008, is predicated on trustworthiness. These are or were fundamentally moral terms 
when there is a breakdown of trust, something significant is wrong. So let, let's think about it. I mean, how much of our wealth today exists in paper money? I think it's like 10%, right? Maybe it, I, I, it might have shifted since I read that a few years ago. I don't know if it's 8%, 20%, but very little, right? Meaning if everyone wants their money out of the banks, the whole system collapses. Forget if everybody does. If a quarter of society wants their money, everything collapses, right? If, you, everybody, if everybody wants to sell their property, right? If the mortgage, if the mortgage system, the, the faith in the system collapses, everything collapses. The whole system of the interdependence, interconnected financial markets exists based on a trust in the system and trust on one another, or we have major collapse of the global financial system and everyone's, uh, everybody goes into complete destitute poverty. I'm not being a doom and gloom person here. I'm just saying that if this is if the societal trust breaks down in our country and globally, the entire financial system collapses. And so that's why, part, partially what Sachs is saying here, the market itself is not moral. It needs morals. And one of those morals that's needed is to main fu a fundamental trust in each other and in the governments that help to regulate such a system. So friends, Yuval Noah Harari. If you don't know this name, you should know him. He is Israeli, but he doesn't want to be known as Israeli. He is, um, he is gay and that emerges in his work, but that's not his primary identity. You can see he's young, but he doesn't want to be thought of as young. He's a whole bunch of things, but actually he's one of the, the fastest growing uh, global scientists, his scientific historians who has written the book Sapiens and, and a number of other books and really has a theory on everything. Just a totally brilliant guy. I disagree with all his conclusions, but I think he's one of the smartest guys alive in terms of how he gets there. So basically he thinks it's all doom and gloom about the future and in, in the, in the future um, based, based on a number of things. Uh, but um, his read of history is just phenomenal. And so you have, if you haven't read Sapiens, you gotta read it. Um, okay, here's what he says. For thousands of years, by the way, one of the things I disagree about, he thinks the Jews are not only statistically insignificant, but insignificant in global history. For me, the Jews, I mean, I'm a little biased. The Jews are the center of the story. What do you mean? The founders of ethical monotheism, right? The birth of the birth of, uh, of, of our Western ideals of human dignity and Selim Elohim and so much of what has made the West great has emerged from, from, from Torah, from Jewish values. I think it's fundamental to history, right? But he's like, no, 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 the Jews, like he doesn't even mention us in, in like in history, in history. Like maybe we're a footnote in there. But but, um, but that, it also helps us because you think Christianity and Islam are like destroying the world. So maybe he doesn't blame us so much. He doesn't give us credit either. So anyways, for thousands of years, philosophers, thinkers, and prophets have besmirched money and called it the root of all evil. Be that as it may, money is also the apogee. Is that the right word? I don't know the word. Apogee? Okay, someone look it up and put in the chat what it, what it means is also the apogee, maybe it's a spelling error too, is the apogee of human tolerance. Money is more open-minded than language, state laws, cultural codes, religious beliefs, and social habits. Money is the only trust system created by humans that can bridge almost any cultural gap. And that does not discriminate on the basis of religion, gender, race, age, or sexual orientation. Thanks to money, even people who don't know each other and don't trust each other can nevertheless cooperate effectively. Whoa, we just turned money on its head. We might've thought money is the root of all problems. People are selfish and greedy and the rich are, just, are, are exploiting the poor and money. If we only had a world without money, right? And Harari says, uh-uh, huh? what do you mean? Huh? Money is the great salvation of our time. Everyone talks about tolerance and acceptance and inclusion, but money's the only vehicle that actually, to some degree, uh, in, in engages people without uh, without such a dis doesn't doesn't discriminate in, a, in its essence at least as to what's going on here. Ah, apo apogee. Okay, Eileen, thank you. But you'll let us know what it means. Apogee. Okay, he continues here. Harari continues, but in its extreme form, belief in the free market is as naive as belief in Santa Claus. Which, by the way. I, uh, I, I, had, I had a very important sit down conversation with my kids last week, only the two oldest. I said, listen, we have to have a conversation. There is no tooth fairy. I said, there is no tooth fairy. And I had that and I felt so terrible. I was like a horrible person. But my, my nine-year-old was really asking and, and I didn't want her to stop trusting us. Like there's, 
there's the, there's, there's the fun of youth. And then there's the learning to trust the world and learning to trust your parents. And they kept asking, like, what is this? And I wanted to maintain the fun and, and the mystery, but I also didn't want them to distrust us. So the, 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 the one who's turning nine this Friday, happy birthday, Amiela. She's turning nine this Friday. Um, she was okay accepting this. And the seven-year-old, who was really the main uh, agitator around the truth here, uh, he, his bubble was really kind of bursting. It was like the world had become too real for him in a sense. He also wanted to know if he's still going to get money. But, <laughs> right? but, but it's an amazing thing when you start to like burst through the bubbles of reality. And, um, and my, my, my three-year-old is a great, um, a great religious Jewish kid who believes in Santa Claus. He, he, he just thinks Santa Claus is the greatest thing in the world. So I have to figure out how I'm going to maintain that and my Jewish commitments, but he, he's really into Santa. Anyways, <laughs> apogee, the highest point in the development of something. Peregrine is the opposite of apogee, um, a point in the orbit of an object circling the earth. Good. Thank you for that, Eileen. Um, so that's, uh, that's good. Okay. Anyways, back to Harari. He says, but in, in, in its extreme form, belief in the free market is as naive as belief in Santa Claus. There simply is no such thing as market free of all political bias. The most important economic resource is trust in the future. And this resource is constantly threatened by thieves and charlatans. Markets by themselves offer no protection against fraud, theft, and violence. It is the job of the political systems to ensure trust by legislating sanctions against cheats and to establish and support police forces, courts, and jails which will enforce the law. When kings fail to do their jobs and regulate the markets properly, it leads to loss of trust, dwindling credit and economic depression. This was the lesson taught by the Mississippi bubble of 1719. And anyone who forgot it was reminded by the US housing bubble of 2007 and the ensuing credit crunch and recession. Okay, by the way, the Mississippi bubble was a financial scheme in France engineered by the Scottish economist theorist, John Law, worth checking out. Okay, friends. So saying that we quote unquote trust does not point us to an easy answer or an obvious path to follow. With trust comes a challenge. Sometimes our trust challenge is to give up control and cultivate the trust to calmly keep walking on the same righteous path as we spiritually wait for change. Other times our trust challenge is to actively change the course and remain confident as we strive to take control of the situation and create change. The headlines each day across the globe remind us that so many in power are corrupt, dishonest, and abusive. It's a sad story for humanity, actually. But let's not be deceived. Countless billions, billions across the globe are living honest, compassionate, and loving lives of integrity each day. This is where the spiritual revolution for good will emerge, with a moral consciousness of deep interconnectivity. Let's keep marching in solidarity together locally and globally in our fervent quest to unite for good while honoring our noble differences. We can trust by and large, even with news making exceptions, that humanity is generally good. So we don't have to be naive and think everyone is good. And we don't have to be uh, so doom and gloom and say everyone is uh, selfish and greedy and out for themselves. We can focus that the majority are out there doing good and also combat the injustices that emerge in the news and get only a fraction of which gets exposed in the news every day. So how do we work to rebuild our, our trust in our lives and in our relationships? Contemporary American research professor and lecturer Brene Brown offers us some wisdom. She writes, in an article on the University of California, Berkeley's Greater Good website, John Gottman describes trust building with our partners in a manner totally consistent with that, what I found in my research and what Ellen and I call the marble jar. What I've found through research is that trust is built in very small moments, which I call sliding door moments after the movie Sliding Doors. Raise your hand if you saw it, Sliding Doors. Raise your hand if you forgot what movies you saw and you haven't seen. Okay, that's me. <laughs> my wife asked me, did you see that movie? I said, I have no clue. So seriously, my wife, uh, somebody asked me, do you know this person? And I say to Shoshana, do I know this person? But she says, have we seen this movie? I say to her, every time I've seen this movie, she knows me better than I know me. I mean, she's brilliant. I'm like, a, my, my brain is very empty in there. I, 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 can't, I can't hold on to a, a lot of memory. She, so she, she holds on to it all. 
So, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very, very lucky. In any case, I don't know if I saw the movie or not. And if I watched it, I still wouldn't know. What I found through research is that trust is built in very small moments, which I call sliding door moments after the movie Sliding Doors. In any interaction, there is a possibility of connecting with your partner or turning away from your partner. Oh, let me give you an example of that from my own relationship. One night, I really wanted to finish a mystery novel. I thought I knew who the killer was, but I was anxious to find out. At one point in the night, I put the novel on my bedside and walked into the bathroom. As I passed the mirror, I saw my wife's face in the reflection and she looked sad, brushing her hair. There, there was a sliding, this was a sliding door moment. I had a choice. I could sneak out of the bathroom and think, I don't want to deal with her sadness tonight. I want to read my novel. But instead, because I'm a sensitive researcher of relationships, I decided to go into the bathroom. I took the brush from her hair and asked, what's the matter, baby? And she told me why she was sad. Now, at that moment, I was building trust. I was there for her. I was connecting with her rather than choosing to think only about what I wanted. These are the moments we've discovered that build trust. One such moment is not that important, but if you're always choosing to turn away, then trust erodes in a relationship very gradually, very slowly. So friends, on the other hand, we learn over and over of the Jewish value of asking questions. So now we're going to the debate, the flip side. We know trust is so important as we talked about, but the Talmud famously teaches about the value of asking questions, most famously at Pesach Seder. I hope we'll all spend Pesach together this year. I hope we will all spend it together um, in Yerushalayim or in Scottsdale or something in between. Um, <laughs> it says here in, um, in the Talmud, if his son is wise, the son asks him. If not, his wife asks him. If not, he asks himself. Even if there are only two scholars who know all the laws of Pesach, they ask each other, which is to say, the questions of Passover are not really about um, teaching someone um, the answers. The, the questions of Pesach are about the questions being asked. We need to ask the questions. Nelson Mandela wrote, it's always great when you run right from the Talmud to Nelson Mandela. It's like there's no gap in between, right? Like all African tribal, how do you pronounce this word? Someone help me. Xosa children. I don't know how to pronounce an X in, in Afrikaans. Xosa children. I acquired knowledge mainly through observation. We were meant to learn through imitation and emulation, not through questions. When I first visited the homes of whites, I was often dumbfounded by the number and nature of questions that children asked of their parents <laughs> and their parents' unfailing willingness to answer them. In my household, questions were considered a nuisance. Adults imparted information as they considered necessary. My life and that of most Zosas at the time, excuse my pronunciation, was shaped by custom, ritual, and taboo. This was the alpha and omega of our existence and went unquestioned. Men followed the path laid out for them by their fathers. Women led the same lives as their mothers had before them. Without being told, I soon assimilated the elaborate rules that govern the relations between men and women. I've been in many, many schools and villages in Africa, and the education looks the same as it does in the yeshivish world. In the yeshivish world, the Rebbe re recites a line and the Talmidim re repeat the line. So too in these African village schools, it is all learning is through repetition, R repetition. You say, you repeat, that's how you learn. And that, that was an old model of education. Of course, in, in fast forward to, to Dewey and liberal education, we started to realize about critical thinking and, and interrogation and questioning and how that emerges. But that wasn't obvious in, before liberal education and certainly is still not obvious in, um, in many parts of the global South uh, and in the, and parts of the yeshivish world. Uh, now. Now, when I say the yeshivish world, obviously, once you're at the, at the age of Talmud, you're going to interrogate. But I'm talking about young children who are learning by, by rote. So uh, Mandela continues. Some of the white African prison warders on Robben Island. Raise your hand if you've been to Robben Island. If you've never been, put it on your bucket list. If you have a bucket list, you got to go to Robben Island. Um, you know, right off of Cape Town, where, where Mandela spent decades. Um, so some of the white African prison warders on Robben Island began to engage us in conversation 
I never initiated conversations with warders, but if they addressed the question to me, I tried to answer. It is easier to educate a man when he wants to learn. Usually these questions were posed with a kind of exasperation. All right, Mandela, what is it you really want? Or look, you have a roof over your head and enough food. Why are you causing so much trouble, Mandela? I would then calmly explain our policies to the warders. I wanted to demystify the African National Congress for them to peel away their prejudices. So this is so interesting. How as a prisoner, he viewed himself as an educator. How he viewed himself as an educator. He's not just asking for the answer of demands for prisoners. He is getting them to learn, which is very different. This is also, people have no clue what I'm talking about. One of my, one of my top 10 advocacy points in the world is that any advocacy organization is also an educational organization. I talk to them, they have no clue what I'm talking about. They're like, we educate, we inform people about the injustices, or we inform them about the truth of Israel, or we inform them, meaning that's not education, that's advocacy. When you tell someone what to believe, no matter how many righteous it is, that's advocacy. Education means you challenge people to think, and there's various conclusions they can come to. I think every advocacy organization needs to have an educational branch to it that actually they don't just offer people conclusions, they challenge people to think. And that's what Mandela was pushing us towards too. He wasn't just saying, give us give this right, give us that right. He was getting people to think and understand on a deeper level. Okay, friends, I know this is a long-winded one, but um, we're gonna get to the, the conversation pretty soon. Back to Sachs. Okay, Sachs is dealing with the power of the question. This is, ra this is radical. We might think, oh, because we're Jews, that all religions are like this, loving questions. It's not true. Many religions, even today, they don't love the questions. The questions are heretical. The questions are a distraction. What matters more than the humility of asking questions is the wisdom of knowing. But here's what Sachs writes. The Hebrew Bible tells the long and often tense story of the childhood of humanity under the parenthood of God. But God does not want humankind to remain in childhood. God wants them to become adults exercising responsibility and freedom. A weak parent wants... To seeks to control their children. A true parent seeks to relinquish control, which is why God never intervenes to protect us from ourselves. That means that we will stumble and fall, but truly by doing so, does a child learn to walk. God does not ask children not to make mistakes. To the contrary, God accepts that in the Bible's own words, there is none on earth so righteous as to do only good and never sin. God asks us only to acknowledge our mistakes and learn from them. Forgiveness is written into the structure of the universe. Now here gets to the gist of it. Abraham, about to become a father to the first child of the covenant, is being taught by God what it means to raise a child. To be a father, implies the Bible, is to teach a child to question, to challenge, confront, and dispute. We might have thought to be a parent is to teach your child right and wrong. Teach them how to tie their shoes. Teach them how to swing. Teach them to be, to be honest. It says no to teach them to question, challenge, confront, and dispute. God invites Abraham to do these things because he wants him to be the parent of a nation that will do these things in the world. He does not want the people of the covenant to be one that accepts the evils and injustices of the world as the will of God. God wants the people of the covenant to be human, neither more nor less. God wants them to hear the cry of the oppressed, the pain of the afflicted, and the, and the plaint of the lonely. He wants them to not accept the world as is because it is not the world that ought to be. He is giving Abraham a tutorial in what it is to teach a child to grow by challenging the existing scheme of things. Only through such challenges does a child learn to accept responsibility. Only by accepting responsibility does a child grow to become an adult and only an adult can understand the parenthood of God. So here, we've come a long way from trust. Whatever happened to trust everybody and trust God and trust your parents. Ah, uh ah, -huh, uh -huh. question everybody, question everything. Questions can prevent, can prevent, present us with a paradox. Gay Orthodox rabbi, and I'm only pointing out that he's gay because it would typically be irrelevant because it's alongside him being Orthodox. And that's crucial to his identity is, his, is that he, he views himself as one of the leading spokespeople for quite a while now about how one can be gay and be orthodox and be halachic and be gay. And he's been writing about that before people were um, even talking about it in traditional terms. And he's a, he's a close friend of mine. And he writes, 
The key to Jewish exegesis, to assume that nothing is obvious, is to assume that nothing is obvious. Questions are the great cultural paradox. They both destabilize and secure social norms. Oh, you might've thought questions only destabilize. He says they also secure social norms. Questions tend to democratize. Ease with questions conveys a fundamental trust in the goodwill and the good sense of others. Autocrats hate questions. We train children at the Pesach Seder to ask why, because tyrants are undone and liberty is won with a good question. Khrushchev once explained why he hated Jews. He said, they always ask why. <laughs> Isn't that amazing that he could even say that? He hates the Jews because they ask why too much. <laughs> It's funny, I, I used to, um, you know, I, anyways, let me, let me bracket that tangent. I, I, I have a certain child who loves the question why, even after I give 20 steps to it, 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 like the why never actually ends. He says, they always ask why. It's for this reason that God loves it when we ask why. Consequently, we celebrate challenging the Torah to make sense and above all, to be a defensible expression of divine goodness when we ask good questions, the Torah is given a new on Sinai at that very moment. As we read the verses from Vayikra about homosexuality, let us make no assumptions in advance in regard to their meaning. Later, we will need to engage the full history of these verses from the Talmud on. For now, let us read it, read as if the Torah was given today. Okay, so, so, so you get that. So he's saying, yes, you gotta learn the history of things. But you also have to ask the big why mo questions of, of, of right now, of right now as well. German language poet Rainer Maria Rilke wrote, be patient towards all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms. Do not now seek the answers. They cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. I wish someone told me this when I was a teenager. As a, teen, as a teenager, you're so distraught by the uncertainty of your future, the stresses of your college applications, and the stresses of what career you're going to have, and who you're going to marry, and where you're going to live, that it, 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 you suffer through the uncertainty. I can't speak for everyone. I know I did. Suffered through the uncertainty. Am I going to make it? Am I going to be on the right? But if we just like live joyfully in the questions. Rabbi Chaim of Volozhin, a student of the Vilna Goen and the founder of the Volozhin Yeshiva, taught in his commentary on Pirkei Avot. It is forbidden for students to accept the words of the teacher if the students have kushiot, challenging objections, questions. Sometimes the student will have the truth just as a little branch can light a large log. Now that might be obvious to us, as us moderns, but in the old model, this wasn't obvious. This was this was a big deal what he was saying. Big deal that kavod harab, respect for the teacher means you don't question them. He says, no, no, it is forbidden for a student to just accept their teacher's words. Biblical commentator, Dr. Aviva Zornberg, who of course at VBM we've been privileged to learn with like all the, almost all the great Jewish educators of our time, so many more to, 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 to engage still. She writes about kushiot, about hard questions. <clears throat> the hard edge sense of language that comes with the negative form generates questions. The Talmudic word for the question is kushya. At its heart is the idea of the hard, the kashya, the difficult, the resistant. For Rav Hutner, the ability to question must now govern the relationship between God and man as between parents and growing children. The aim of the relationship is to create in Rav Hutner's imagery, the face of one who can receive who actively generates meaning by asking questions. Now the dialogue is the model for evoking narratives without the capacity to ask, to open up the closed issues, to break through the obvious, the self understood, there can be no meaningful narrative. For questions do destabilize. They find difficulty and distance where one might have dreamt of ease and continuity. So friends, here's where I'm gonna pause. And I'm sorry this was so long-winded. We must learn to live with trust, but we also must learn to trust in our asking questions, living in uncertainty and dwelling in paradox. The more we trust our epistemic foundation, 
the deeper we can travel into our inquiry. Okay, friends, I'm gonna pause there. I see the first hand is up from Eileen. So Eileen, why don't you kick us off, please? Hi, um, first thing, it's apogee and perigee. perigee. And that is astronomy. And it's used when the earth is at its apogee, it's closest to the sun, okay? Second, um, when we stop asking questions, we're dead. Intellectual curiosity is what pushes us forward and autocrats and dictators hate it because they're on the assumption what they're doing is right. And when that little voice says, but why? You're throwing all of their construct into chaos. Great, great. Eileen, thank you for that. First of all, I know literally nothing about astronomy. Which is which is I, one of the great things about being a parent is you have to learn about things because you get all kinds of questions, right? But I literally know nothing about astronomy, so thank you for that. And those are good words for us to know. And they, they strike me as philosophical in, a, in addition to astronomical, um, and um, astronomical. Uh, um, but also to your second point, I think you're right about how questions keep us alive and flourishing. And to be sure, just because we should ask lots of questions doesn't mean we have to be obnoxious. There are ways to do question asking that is, are conjunctive and ways to do it where it's disjunctive. Conjunctive, our questions can bring us closer together and disjunctive, our questions can drive wedges between us. Um, so if a spouse um, sees their spouse come home and says, where were you? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that doesn't strike me as a question that brings us closer. They say, oh, I, hope, I, I hope you had a great day. I know you're normally home at six. I see it's 6.15. Like, I'm you know, uh, curious what's going on for you, whatever the case is, like a way to have inquiry that brings us closer. So just because we validate lots of questions doesn't mean we have to be um, you know, fill in the blank for what you want to call someone who's, um, who their questions always come off as, as more agitating than, um, than fruitful. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, um, I think that uh, being Jewish, it's in our DNA to question. And that's why uh, the skepticism probably all of us wrote at one in, in some form or other in the poll, we were all skeptical because we don't accept, I mean, there's certain things that you do accept as face value, but I just think it's built into us. And, and you, uh, you know, beautifully mentioned the, the, the uh, Seder where we ask so many questions. I mean, we, it does get uh, annoying, uh, you know, with kids when they are, they're constantly saying, why, 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 but that's okay. Because I think that's training for when they're older and mature and adults and you continue to question. And I just think it's part of, you know, because we have the right as Jews, we have the right to question everything that I, I think the whole skepticism, cynicism, whatever you want, I, I, I won't call it distrust, but I will just, the, the, you know, the yearning to know more is, awesome. is just part, part of us. I love it. I love it. That, that's so powerfully said, Cheryl. Thank you for that. And, you know, I, I was in a synagogue on Shabbat where I saw something I've never seen before. You'll tell me if you've seen it anywhere else. Um, next to the sculptures in this synagogue lobby of all their past rabbis, like these, you know, <laughs> these big sculptures staring down at you, was a big sculpture of Einstein. Um, I was like, whoa, that's kind of startling. What is that? And I thought about it, and I was like, oh, like, yeah, Einstein's just like a model Jew for his great contributions to humanity and his genius and brilliance. But also, what's amazing for him as a Jew is not that his conclusions necessarily end up being particularly Jewish, but his yearning with questions is particularly Jewish. He models living a life of inquiry and how that inquiry can lead to great, um, to, to, towards great progress in terms of findings. But, I, but remind me who said this, some famous scientist um, uh, you know, famously said that th his mother would always say to him um, said, when sending him off to school, um, uh, don't, don't be the one to get the right answer in class, uh, be the one to have the best question in class, something like that. Basically like, and then at the end of the day, she would, she would, she would ask like, what was, your, what was your question today? essentially. So she would, yeah, yes. Hi, Scott. Oh, oh could I just add one, one more oh, thing yeah, sure. just, to, just to add on to what you said, it's, and it's a shameless plug for the um, Phoenix, the Greater Phoenix Jewish Film Festival, is one of the films that we're showing this year is a documentary called Still a Revolutionary, and it's about 
um, Albert Einstein. So I think uh, it should be, and there's an interview with the director, um, the filmmaker after after the uh, the film is shown. So if anyone's interested, look at look at the website. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Thank since you. We're make, since we're making plugs, I'm going to make a plug too. So VBM, we're doing science and religion right now also. If you're interested in that, reach out to us because we're we're very interested in not not the how science and religion butt up against each other, but how they're additive and how they're generative together. So, so good. And yeah, make sure to see that film because that's the film festival is awesome. Hi, Scott. Hey, how you doing? Um, hey, I'm curious how you think, um, do you have a point of view on how social media plays into all this because yeah. you know one of the things that i worry about as a citizen as a parent whatever business leader is there just seems to be just no like shared ground truth anymore and there just seems to be this just cacophony of just noise out there and like my son when i talk to him about the pandemic he'll quote kyrie irving and i'm like you're quoting a basketball player like that's where you're getting your theories on you know how to deal with a pandemic or what you know and so like i guess um do you view social media as like the ultimate questioning playground where you can go and find all sorts of individuals and resources and truth that would have been hard to assemble before and that's a good thing or do you view it as terrible because there's just you just get question fatigue, question overload almost. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, oh my goodness. Uh, I am so excited because my kids are going to realize soon how old I am, um, <laughs> especially when I say things like this. I think social media is the worst and the downfall of society. You know, <laughs> you know, no, but really, I, I mean, I think there's so much good for potential there, but it's so misused. It is so misused. Of course, us connecting with each other globally, democratizing conversations, like being able to maintain more relationships and share information and crowdfund and be able to pr promote our events and uh, maintain maintain old connections and and challenge each other and have and and move away from media as our primary source of information and of learning and. Um, and crowdsourcing in addition to crowdfunding, the potential for good is so enormous and 99% of it is junk. It is junk. It is either full of lies, it is full of ego, it is full of screaming, it is full of uh, distractions from the real world as we know it, where we move into illusions. And that's why I reject the metaverse and those who wanna to move to a virtual reality type of world where we no longer touch each other in the flesh, talk to each other face to face, that we just want to have physical, you know, uh, we just want to have um, uh, physiological highs. We just want to have physiological highs in our experience of pleasure in entering virtual realities. I think that we need to return to the concrete world of touch and of face-to-face -face engagement and of debate and of dialogue. And we need to understand who are the holders of truth. And it's not just basketball players. I mean, they have their own truth. Celebrities have such an enormous a platform and P and um, on Twitter and beyond as if these people have like PhDs in what they're talking about. It's all just loud and simple. And some of them are smart people. Some of them are even good, responsible people. But these are not the people who should be guiding our social discourse because they're really good at basketball or because they were really good in a Hollywood movie or Whoopi Goldberg, who's, who's I'm sure a delightful human being and a great actress who now is going to say that the Holocaust had nothing to do with race. If you know anything about Hitler yeah. and about Nazism, you know he want, this was this was this was racist. It was about it was about extinguishing a race. Now the question of whether Judaism is a race is a different question, but to deny the Holocaust anything to do with it. And so we have a lot of foolish people who have massive platforms. And um, and so again, I know I sound really old old saying this <laughs> stuff because I, I I I value the huge potential for good that emerges with social media. It is one of the necessary evils. Like I'm, I'm, I, I would never say immersed. I spend very few minutes each day on social media, but it's crucial to the work we do and how we think of engaging yeah. other people in this and that. Yeah. And yet I have a lot of fear for the next generation, not only on, as Scott brought up, of the source of truth, not only determining who is an authority, even while we wanna question authority, who are the authorities I should read and learn from on science? Who are the people I should read and learn from when it comes to literature, it comes to politics, like even being able to distinguish one person from the next. Yeah. Then it goes back to instant gratification. Then it goes has to do with our sense of self-identity and identity as portrayed in society. How do I put myself forth? We can go on and on. But I think that, that if we provided no education to children, 
We just say, these are tools you can just figure out how to use on your own. We will have done such a great disservice because they will get lost in the abyss of just surfing on every one of these media channels um, uh, in ways that I think rewires the brain. Essentially losing the capacity for empathy, for critical thinking, the social media will come to actually in a neuroplasticity sense, reshape our brains, how our brains think, how our brains process, the social media companies will actually have um, info, you know, uh, <laughs> um, intruded and, and, and infiltrated into uh, the most basic sense of what makes us human. Hi, Vicky. I want to say, number one, I agree with much of what you said, and I just wanted to reiterate three things. Uh, first of all, is the, is the need for us always to know our sources of the information. Um, too many people read things and just accept it as the truth without looking at the sources. Um, the second thing is what you said, critical thinking, which is to apply critical thinking to what we're reading or what we're listening to. And the third thing is um, uh, going back to Carol Gilligan, who I love, of radical, radical listening. And um, during these last two years, I've tried much harder to listen and to read more widely um, because I realize that I need to understand where other people are coming from, whether I disagree with what they're saying. And again, this has to do with looking at the source of who it is, whether it's worth my time to read it. But somebody who is speaking on the other side of an issue where I think I, ha I know where I think, but it's good to know what other people are thinking, um, really in terms of us moving ahead, trying to resolve issues in our country uh, and in the world. Anyway, thank you. I love it. Thank you so much for that. That that was really that was really helpful. All three of those points are really generative, uh, and I completely agree with. And you know, just to add one other thing here before we go to Eddie here, um, I think the other thing that's at risk here is our sense of value. Our sense of value, just as a form of white supremacy, uh, essentially made our value what we produce. I am as valuable in society as what I can produce, not in who I am. So too. We can see young people's value, not only young people, but let's just talk about young people. Um, their sense of value is completely distorted. They're not, the, the sense of value is not for the soul, for the mind, for their own sense of self-worth. Their value is the number of connections on social media, the response they get to their social media, the likes and the engagement. It is, it is um, it, and, it, and it's really painful. It's really, it's really, really painful. So yeah, hi, Eddie. Yeah, thank you so much for this, Rabbi. Um, I come from a culture where questioning was really, really frowned upon, um, and it was almost treated as, as mischievous and misbehaving uh, in my culture to, to continuously ask questions. As I started to evolve and, and grow in my older years, um, the response to my questioning was met with the answer of faith. It was always like, have faith in this, have faith in that. Uh, I guess, uh, what are your comments on that when, and when folks uh, are, are met with the answer of having faith uh, instead of the continuation of the questioning is to believe in, in, in having faith or hope rather than con to continue the conversation on, on the question? Okay, I love it. I love it. Um, well, first of all, I just can't imagine um, any responsible educator shutting down questions for any reason, most certainly uh, with a conclusion just to have, just to have faith. Um, because I think it's, it's, it's constructed as a false binary in the way that I also intentionally presented it, that there's questioning or there's faith. Um, and if I'm questioning, that means that faith is now an impossible enterprise. And so um, uh, my, my notion of faith has nothing to do with kind of a blind, a blind acceptance um, of something that contradicts our reason. Um, I have a very different sense of that. <clears throat> and yet, and so, yeah, so I absolutely... I absolutely agree with that um, and feel, you know, uh, uh, strongly that, um, that that would be kind of a dangerous, that would kind of be a dangerous way to think of, of, of religion. And it could lead to a lot of potential harms too. On the other hand, in liberal society, what's the worst that you could, what's the worst you could do as a liberal? You, you, you get duped. The worst you could do as a liberal is be duped. You don't want to be duped. So you want to, you want to, you want to question everyone because if I accept someone, I might, I might be exposed, I get duped, right? So what does it mean? If, I, if 10 homeless people ask me for money, I'm not gonna give to any of those 10 because one of them is lying. And I don't wanna get duped by that one. So I'm gonna give to none of them. I'd rather give to all 10 and let one of them dupe me. Let five of them dupe me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not suspecting that we should assume 
dupers are out there, but I'd rather be duped on one of the 10 and get it, get it right nine of the 10 times than give to nine people who need it. And get, but some people, I'm not going to donate money because those nonprofits or those people asking, right, how are they, they're, they're going to dupe me. I don't want to be duped. So too, I'm not going to vote in the election. I'm not going to vote in the election because all politicians are corrupt. And I feel like I'm getting duped if I vote with someone because they're eventually going to dupe me, right? And so I'm just going to disengage from democracy and from, from the electoral process. Or theology. I'm not going to engage in religion at all because I, all the religious people are, are um, you know, essentially, you know, had made, the, made this stuff up. And so I think that, that um, just like we want to question any educational approach, which is this going to give the answer as faith, I think so too, as Jews, we also want to distance ourselves from this, from this place that feels like I need to be the smartest person in the room. And by being the smartest person in the room, I need to show that I disbelieve everything. I, I, I don't believe anything. And I question everything as if that, I, I, because then there's nothing to actually affirm. I, here's one more way to say it before we go to Michael. The other way to say it is we should never remain as children in our questions. We answer our questions and then we go to the next layer of questions. And we get smarter and we, we don't have perfect answers, but we resolve those questions and we go to our next questions. So the question is not always, is there a God? Like, how can there be evil and be a God? We don't have to stay at 101 on everything. Let's, make, let's get some answers, not perfect, but we have some resolution and go to the next layer of questions, right? Um, and so um, otherwise we live in a paralysis of just complete uncertainty. Hi, Michael. Hi. Um... The whole question of trust is, is, is complex, of course. We have to evaluate it at, you know, different, different parts. Of it. First of all, what, you know, is the source intending to be truthful? Are they, are, they, are, they, are they saying or communicating what they think is the truth? Secondly, what is their knowledge base? Do they have the knowledge base to, to have an answer to our question that has some substance to it? Then at the third level, what is their intent? Is their intent to convince us, to sell us, to undercut us? And, and it, it makes the whole question of trust um, much more comp complex as we try to evaluate it and, and put this together and, and how we interpret and use and affect our belief system um, from what we're being interacting with. Michael, what was your third one? I got intent, knowledge, and what was your third one? Well, I, I'm, the third one was, did they think it was the truth? It was the ah, first ah, one. Okay. Oh, oh, in the, the so third call one was Let's call that integrity. Integrity. Yeah. Okay, good. So good. So Michael's three categories, I think are really great. One, what do we think this person's intention is in the, in the truth they're articulating? Number two, do they actually have the knowledge base to actually understand and, and, and defend such a claim? And third, do they actually have the integrity that we can trust it? So the, the, um, I think that's, a, that, that's really great and really helpful as we think about truth. And, and then there's also the self-interrogation. Why is it that I'm so embracing of the truths that I am? Are they just comfortable? Are they just convenient? Do they fit in with my own biases? Just as I'm willing to challenge the external authorities, am I willing to challenge the internal authorities in regards to my own acceptances of truths? Now, Daniel Kahneman, as you, as many of you, I'm sure, have read many, many books about um, the, the famous Israeli psychologist. Um, he writes about, and with Amos Tversky, who passed away, and Kahneman uh, is, doesn't have much time left, uh, uh, unfortunately, either. But um, he, he, he writes about actually how experts, uh, we give far more credibility to experts than we should. He said, for example, doctors, and I, and I'm, I, I very much want to promote our support of medical experts, but doctors by and large, um, uh, uh, believe, uh, he, he said statistically, believe their expertise to be more accurate than it is. And that's why people encourage second opinions such that actually the exact same case will be um, understood very, very differently by different medical experts. Um, and he, his, his, uh, the other example he chose to, uh, goes to great length on is, um, is NBA recruiters. He says NBA recruiters also similar to some medical experts, and, and, and we could use any field here really, uh, he said, think they need to go watch the game. They need to go to the high school game or the college game and watch the player. But actually, all you need is the objective statistics. 
right? They overestimate the value of their personal expertise in witnessing it. So too in medicine, it's the objective, it's the objective numbers that are needed much more than the sub subjective experts engagement, he argues over and over. And, um, and so his point there is not that we should, um, oh, his, and his third big example is judges in the courtroom. He said judges overestimate their, um, uh, their objectivity, but that actually the exact same case in the courtroom finds radically different conclusions in different courtrooms with uh, almost identical cases. And so his, his case there is not, we should throw out the subjective. He says, yes, we need, we need algorithms. We need medical algorithms. We need legal algor algorithms. We need NBA recruit, recruiter algorithms that focus on the objective because the objective is always more accurate than the subjective analysis of the expert. Even though the subjective expert always believes they're better than the numbers, they are needed because what they bring to the table is far beyond the numbers. Whether that's a medical expert, a, a judge, a, a recruiter, fill in the blank, fill in the blank. And so, um, and so on the one hand, we don't wanna live in a world of algorithms that's purely objective in how courtrooms operate or how police officers operate or how doctors operate. On the other hand, we want to remove bias. We want to remove the, 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 um, the potential for errors, the potential for subjectivity to get in the way. So how do we, how do we balance all of that? And so Michael's questions here are really great that someone actually might be the, the right expert to go to. They might even have the integrity of being honest. And yet by nature of truth, by nature of the complexity of medicine and law and everything we deal with in society, everyone doesn't know everything and there always are errors. And so how do we account? How do we account for that? How do we trust, but also still interrogate, right? Okay, time for one more thought. Maybe someone we haven't heard yet, Julia or Barbara or Yehuda or Steve or Eric. Mm -hmm. Hi, Steve. I'm one rabbi, it's Steve. Um, we, are, we are told to embrace the stranger. How do we trust the stranger before embracing the stranger? I love it. I love it. This has been on my mind ever since Colleyville. Because in Colleyville, what we happens after is we say, oh, we need to lock our Jewish institutions. We already knew that, right? We need more cameras, more walls, more security, more, right? Anybody come in. And we need to be the rabbi who's going to welcome the stranger at the door and say, come in and have some tea. Come in, have some tea. That's what the rabbi in Colleyville did. I mean, what a mensch, right? And, um, and so how, yeah. And so how do, so how do we, and let's bracket the Jewish communal policy, right? Because that's a whole conversation in itself. But how do we welcome the stranger before we trust them? And I think Steve's question is so much greater than any answer I can give. Um, it's such a profound question of, because normally what we think of as trust, going back to Brene Brown, is I can trust you because I have a series of experiences that show me you're not the type who's going to hurt me. I've been hurt many times in my life and I put certain people in that bucket, right? And unfortunately, stereotypes are involved in that. If I'm black and I see a white police officer, I might put you in the category of the person who's going to hurt me. If I'm white, and I think of black folks as gangsters, right? I see a black person approaching the car, I might in my stereotyping think this is a person who might hurt me, right? If I am a woman who has been hurt in many relationships over years and I'm gonna be on a date, I might be skeptical, this is a, right? So, so, so the main way we think of trust is as trust building. I will trust you when I have enough data to know you're not someone who's gonna hurt me because I have a history of experience and a history of stereotypes and biases that lead me to caution myself. Right. Um, and, and so uh, on the other hand, that's why the Torah comes and says you have to love and protect and trust even when you don't have the data that you should trust. Right. Even when the person emerges and um, and you don't have the data that this is someone I can trust, the responsibility is still there. The responsibility is still there. So how do we live? How do we live with that? How do we? Um, how do we hold that need for trust? And yet also, um, also um, keep ourselves safe. And that is the space of vulnerability. And that's why I believe leadership and social justice work and, and, uh, and, and anything we do Jewishly and relationships by and large, they thrive when we are willing to be vulnerable. Vulnerable in the space where we open ourselves up when we don't have a da enough data yet to trust 
that we won't be hurt. Now that's easier to say when you don't have a lot of trauma in your life. Uh, when you've had more, it's gonna be even harder. Um, but I think this is not only the only possibility for love because love only works through vulnerability, but it's also um, uh, the only way that we can fulfill the moral mandate to love the stranger because the stranger is fundamentally the person we can't trust yet. The Torah says, love God. Not so many times. The Torah says, love your fellow Jew. Only once. Love the stranger. Take care of the stranger 36 times. How do we love and protect when we don't have the data of trust? Everyone, I want to wish you a wonderful day. But before I do that, I want to welcome you to our session next week. It's not something you would expect. The debate is between humor versus seriousness. Should we be very serious or very funny, right? It does Judaism allow for jokes or does it allow for being very, very serious? We will find out the answer or at least the question next week. God bless.